Welcome back to the Catalyst Pharmacy Podcast. Today, we had a really special guest, Jeff Harrell, with the Cascadia Pharmacy Group, CEO of that group, uh, along with, he's the president-elect of NCPA, chairman of the board for AAP, and then also on the board with Align Rx. So kind of a heavyweight in the industry. It was such a fun, fun podcast. Talked about just one, their model in general at Cascadia, kind of their partnership program that they have with all the pharmacies that they have and all the partners that they have in there. Um, and then into the legislative efforts that CPAs run a point on along with what pharmacists can do as well into like uh, kind of some PBM conversations and just great operational stuff and some things that make some of their pharmacies really unique and maybe front end, compounding, you name it. So it was a great podcast. Love it. Love Jeff. Take you there now. Thanks. Well, thanks for being with us this morning, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. I'm excited. Couldn't um, sleep. <laughs> 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 That's not because of us. I'm sure of that. Um, yeah. But uh, hey, I wanted to give you a quick compliment before we get going. Wow. Okay. What people tell me about you is you're like by far one of the more I mean, obviously you're a leader in the, in the industry itself, but you're just so accessible. Like, I don't, I think, I feel like you give your, your name, your email, your everything out to everybody all the time. And everyone's like, he always responds. He always tries to help no matter who it is. So I just wanted to say that to you. I've had multiple people say that to me. So, well, um, I, uh, I appreciate that. It's funny that you say that because I kind of built this on that. You know, I've told people that I got to be accessible for my partners, you know, when they need me. And unfortunately it's 24 seven sometimes. Um, and, uh, it's built the success to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, it takes away in other areas of life. Don't get me wrong, but, um, it definitely, that, that, that ability to reply in a timely manner is huge to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Um, anyway, I wanted to, I wanted to start us off that way. Um, uh, I think you're one of the few people who's been on this show three times. So wow, pre- yeah. the trifecta. Uh, yeah, I really, I think you're one of three. I think you're. Do, the, do the, we do the old one, two, three? <laughs> right, the Carmelo <laughs> Anthony thing. There. Yeah, yeah, right. A little little Steph Curry. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we'll get you a three dollar bill, maybe. Uh, yeah, there we go. From that perspective, but uh, appreciate you being on. Um, I wanted to give everyone still a refresh, I mean, even though this is your third time. There's been a lot of time between yep. uh, now and the last one. Can we can we refresh on? kind of your organization, what you do, what, how many pharmacies you're up to now too. I think that's just cool to, to, to know, but then like a little bit of your, your partnership model and talk about, um, you don't have to go quite all the way back to what, how it all started, but sure. like what the model looks like today and, and, and what you guys are doing. Yeah, no, um, I'll just, I'll, I'll fast forward that, uh, the, the beginning of it I started in 2006. Yep. Uh, I bought it on my first stores, but, um, you know, I just realized we had to get to some scale, mm-hmm. um, you know, after about four or five, six stores. And if you didn't get to scale, um, you were just going to be kind of doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe, you know, may, maybe having the same economic impact, you know, nof- nothing extra for the extra work you're putting in. So kind of did this model. Uh, Bill Osborne, um, you know, mm-hmm. I mentioned it before, was my my mentor. Um, it's kind of funny now because the mentor mentors the mentee, uh, so, <laughs> and vice versa. Oh, so sure. uh, the, or I, sh- I should say the mentee mentors the mentor. <laughs> uh, so him and I have a great relationship, but um, you know, adding all this, this, this partner model in, um, and there's no, I don't have a recipe. I didn't stick to you know cut and dry. I need this and you need to get this. You know, right. and it's really actually developed quite. Um, a nice relationship between all the partners because you know each person and each 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 partner each seller each buyer all it, it's always different we, there's always a different personality there's always a different reason there's always a different financial um outcome or a financial picture that, that that's different so i didn't i don't have a recipe i mean like it's not a chocolate chip cookie and this is right. what we make it's a cookie and we do we have different ingredients each time so started um adding partners and uh you know i have eric and 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 will are probably my uh, original kind of um partners there and 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 i got great partners all across the board but uh, we've just kind of grown um by word of mouth and now um we got to you know 15 16 18 stores. Um, and it got up into the twenties and then I realized, okay, you know, this is getting where, you know, like you said, I'm accessible, but this is getting where Jeff needs some help. We need yeah. some layers because, uh, you know, we're all human and, and it, some degree you gotta be able to admit that. And so started, uh, I started it actually last year, um, and really have kind of built it out this year is, is building a, 
um, it's a management kind of company okay. over all of the stores. So we have uh, 36 locations. By the end of the month, we'll have 38. Uh, closing on a couple more here in August. Um, so that puts us uh, in three states, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Um, and I've got about 14 partners, uh, several partners. We've got multiple locations together, um, but about 14 partners. And again, in, in various you know percentages, mo- mostly the 50-50 thing, but got it. Um, you know, um, but there's there's different situations for each one. And so, um, you know, back to the pharmacy matchmaker po- uh, episode that I did, um, we have got a group of people who are dogs in the industry, mm-hmm. who are unbelievably intelligent and smart and have work ethic like no other. They understand, you know, how to make this model work. And they we all like each other. And that's the tough part. I mean, we, 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 we work hard, we yeah. party, um, and we're a big family. And so it's really worked out well. I'm pretty selective when it comes to who's coming in as a partner. I know I keep um, asking I, and keep still giving me that. Keep, yeah. <laughs> keep asking. Still keep giving me the Heisman. That's all right. I'll, I'll worry you now. Yeah. We, we can't have two redheads working together. <laughs> it's, you know, it's fair. It's fair. It's yeah. much less. We're doing this remote. Um, uh, but no, that that's good. Um, so a little bit of that, I know you said you're, you're selective. I know I kind of jumped and interrupted, but, um, um, with that, who do you look for? What are you doing? And, and for the most part, are you looking with partners to that want to scale a little bit too? um, yourselves? I, I know there's probably, you said you have 14, you have more, way more stores than that. And so I, I met amount. Most of them are multi or partners with multi stores as well. Is that a, you start with one or you go by, I'm sure it happens organically differently depending on what's out there yeah. for acquisition and what you choose to start up. But I guess, can you tell us and describe a little bit of like the, the, the partner and then also the, the journey the partner goes on from probably one store to two. And sometimes they open with two maybe, but. Uh, yeah. So it's, uh, it just depends on the makeup of the partner. I mean, you can have a great fit and they're, they're content with just one location. Okay. You know, they're going to work their location. They're going to be work in their community. They're going to give back. They're going to do everything just to the, you know, to the top shelf that they can do it, but they're not interested, you know, maybe, um, you know, they got a young family or, just the circumstances don't get them too excited. And then I've got, you know, the same partner who has, um, you know, has similar personalities. Like I said, we get all get, get along great, but it's got that dog, got that that hunger in them. You know, um, I, they always say Dana White is is someone that I, I love, you know, the UFC Dana White. Um, and he um, has all these different quotes that he says, you know, and they're all like, man, if you're not if you're not growing, you're dying. You know, if, if you're not comfortable being uncomfortable, you know, you're not going to get anywhere in life. Um, you know, I was reading one this morning by Bruce Lee and it's like, man, if you if you don't push yourself to the edge, there's no reason to live. You know, and so these other partners and, and not to say the other ones don't have it, but they got that extra want to want to go ahead and go. And so I have, you know, like Eric out in Spokane, I think we've got four or five locations. Right. Um, you know, Will and Courtney, a wonderful uh, tag team pharmacist partnership uh they've got four locations right now i think uh yeah one one two three four five five mm-hmm. locations um but actually recently i've, I've uh, put on a new one matt bender um who actually partnered through the podcast oh. uh, oh, cool. the guy that was going to sell the store saw my podcast with three of you guys um and said you need to talk to jeff well matt now in less than three years has three locations in the seattle market um and just like that you know he went from one to three and more than likely, he'll be at four, five, six, you know, down the road. Um, I got a young guy just come out in Oregon. He kind of came out of the woodwork, uh, Tyler, Tyler Deering. Mm-hmm. Um, he went from one store to two stores in 90 days. What? <laughs> 90 days. Yeah, record, man. And the kid is just a dog. He's a twin. His brother's an ophthalmologist. Uh, he, was, he has his own practice. He says, I want to do my own pharmacy. I said, listen, I, I got one right now. I got another one coming in 90. And I said, we get these right and we'll get you back to your hometown and we'll open one there. And so he left his family. He's living in a trailer out in Southern Oregon running two pharmacies um, and knowing that in about 12 to 18 months, he's going to go back home to his community and open another pharmacy wow. and, and manage these three. So it, it, ha- it can happen fast, man. It can really happen fast. I have a couple of uh, gals who... Uh, uh, are, were kind of part of this uh, network when we opened that backfill of uh, a couple of pharmaca uh-huh. stores that went bankrupt. Yep. Um, and they have since 
gone and we've reopened one uh, backfill there okay. and they are going to go to one, two and three. And so uh, again, it's the makeup of, of the person. Um, and you know, I, 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 I listen to that. If, if they want to go, I, I'll put my foot on the gas pedal. If they don't, um, then, you know, they just, you know, they're part of the group and, and they contribute and it's, it's wonderful. Wow. Wow. How often do y'all get together then? Like, that's a lot of, that's a lot, that's a lot of owners. Um, yeah. that's a lot of it's, phone calls to Jeff too. Um, and I'm sure they use each other as well. Like how, how often do you, like, as from a governance perspective, I don't know if that's the right term, but, uh, you guys are just kind of getting together. Is that like a monthly thing? That's a lot to, it's a lot to wrangle individually as it, as it scales out. Right. Yeah. So we started with a little room, you know, we're six or seven of us were in there. Um, and it's grown. And so we meet twice a year. Okay. We do a biannual in-person meeting. Uh, then we have a once a month call. Um, and layering the Cascadia Pharmacy Group and building it out, I have hired two um, uh, gals that are both pharmacists to kind of run uh, the programs, one clinical, one kind okay. of st- strategy as well as kind of uh, helps me take a lot of pressure off of me. Um, and then I've kind of structured in Will and Eric as well within Cascadia uh-huh. um, and to take to take some of that that away because you're right. It is a lot and a lot of people. Um, I think we had uh, 32 on the call yesterday. We had a partner call oh, um, and that, that includes some managers. So I have some stores that I sure. own 100 percent of that. I have some real key managers and, and we key positions. So in those calls, we have that. But we meet face to face twice a year. Um you guys, Josh has been out, mm-hmm. you know, and and spoke to us several times, um, and and always loved, and we seem to increase the time for him. Because he, <laughs> I think y'all got him again, didn't it, you? Yeah. I don't know personality if he's more popular or if it's the subject spotlight, but I think it's a, it's both. Either he's way, a guy. right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you, man, they're they're special meetings. You know, back to the pharmacy matchmaker. We got one uh, start uh, October third through the sixth. Uh, it's going to be up in Seattle. So mm-hmm. one meeting, we go to a community of where a pharmacy owner is. Okay. So then we can see their pharmacies and do different things. And then the other meeting is typically. Um, in a place, a different place that we choose, you know, maybe a warm place or something, um, to get us out of the Pacific Northwest in the winter time. Yeah, so, yeah, the winter time um, might be tough. Yeah, so it's actually really evolved. I mean, we actually got some vendors coming to this 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 latest one, um, and I mean, it surprised me. It's like they're giddy to be there, and we're giving you know two solid hours of all the partners and. Um, it's really manifested into something pretty special, man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It it seems like that. And the, I guess from the, like also from the partner's perspective, it has got to be the best, like, like business ownership university you could be a part of. Like really you're getting like real live. Like I'm, I know they all did their probably rotations or whatever in pharmacy school and all of that stuff. And I don't think all of it still is quite enough when you're talking about running a business in in that perspective. Um, you've got like the best mentor mentee, it, it sounds like one of the best programs in the country for just learning how to really operate businesses, not only from you down to everybody else, but also for just like peer to peer. And that B- big time. I mean, we do a lot of it with the students at University of Washington, Washington state, um, and also Oregon state. Uh, but what we did recently, when this is the, the two hires of, of Crystal and Tara is, uh, is we've now started our own, um, um, pharmacy. Oh, uh, you're doing a residency re- program? Residency. Yeah, oh, a nice. full residency program. And so you're right. I mean, the, the richness of what we can give to yeah, it's just uh, a new student, um, a, a new graduate that wants to get into business is, I would say, second to none. Yeah. I mean, it is. You it, know, it's we got, it's, very, it's awesome. pro, very few programs in the country that even offer anything remotely to that on a, like a university scale. But then also it's just tough to, you know, find those throughout wherever you are in the U.S. in general. So um, yeah, that's really cool. Um, so when it comes to that kind of reach you guys have that, that as you're getting out and you're scaling, um, I imagine, uh, data, data and keeping your arms around data is, uh, super important. Um, talk, talk to, I knew you, you talked about that a little bit the last episode as well. Yeah. And I think all y'all have done was build upon that since then. Um, so, so data, I mean, data's king, you guys know it. Um, mm-hmm. any, any company that, I mean, um, the data drives the machine. Um, and I always say this, and, and those that have heard me are, are probably laughing, but data doesn't lie, people do. Mm. And uh, they don't mean to lie. Yeah. But they're, they're, they're giving you their take by, with emotion, um, with guesstimates, with, you know, hey, I sold 12 of those. I go, okay, well, let's look at the data. Well, you sold six. 
two got stolen and, and four other ones were bought by employees, you know, the, the, the data gives it to you. And, and so right now, uh, when I bought a store, um, oh gosh, I think it's been almost five years ago now, there was a pharmacist there, Ben, and he, um, he didn't want to continue really being in the pharmacy. And so I was driving back, um, driving back from that store and I'm like, God, what am I going to do with Ben? The guy's super talented and, and intelligent. I mean, makes me look like, you know, a doofus. And, uh, and so I, I, it just all hit me. I'm like, you know what? It's time for us to start doing the data. And so we've put Ben in this data role. He's a pharmacist, mm-hmm. which gives us another like whole dynamic. Another um, lens than, to look yeah. through. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, he understands. He understands what a BER, GER is. He understands AWP minus. He understands, you know, cost plus. He understands everything. And it has grown into, I don't know, I'd put it up against any in the country again, you know, kind of like that. It's our, our data analytics program and it's with Ben. Um, and we're also utilizing some of the tools that AAP offers, um, you know, data wise. And uh, man, it's caught contracts not paying correctly. It's allowed me to, you know, use data to go back to payers that are underpaying us in markets that, you know, that it shouldn't be. Um, it allowed us to, you know, pick and choose customers, unfortunately. I mean, the the PBMs have, have really commoditized the customer, yeah. uh, the, the patient, you know, and it's sad because, you know, Mrs. Jones, we may be losing 500 a month on her and she's been there for, for 30 years, you know, and we have to say, Mrs. Jones, unfortunately, you know, the, this landscape of pharmacy, we can't fill your prescriptions anymore, but the PBMs have backed us into those corners um, by commoditizing the patient. So the data is huge, absolutely huge. Gotcha. Um, so fr- from, from that, let's, you, you kind of talked about it with the, with the PBMs and, and, and some of that stuff. Let's, let's kind of dive into that. Look, I've been asking everybody, I've seen a lot of people like with as many closures going on in the, yep. across the U S with whether it's CVS Walgreens, right. I'm going to say quote unquote, right sizing or, or whatever with Rite, Rite Aid as well. i right. um, trying to figure out bankruptcy. Um, you've had probably an influx of patients at times, depending on which stores they are. Um, I'm sure that's a math equation as much as it is. I just want to serve my community as well. Yeah, it's been, it's been interesting because we're filling more prescriptions than we ever have. Right. Okay. Um, you know, we had uh, the buy Mart closure, you know, that's down right. in Oregon. Yeah. Y'all had those um, too. Mm-hmm. yeah and, that, and that, and we had stores stood right next to buy Mart. So I had one store go from 1500 scripts a week to 3000, oh, you wow. know, overnight. Yeah, uh, what's kind of funny is I, I went to, <laughs> I went to buy Mart and said, Hey, you know, I know you guys are closing in the Portland, Oregon area. I said, would you like to sell me your files here out in the Medford area? And he goes, they go, no, pack sand, Jeff. I said, okay, I'll get them for free. And guess what? We got them for free. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it has been tough. And it's not necessarily just um, just the closures, you know, or the consolidation of, of some of these underperforming sites in the Walgreens okay. and the Rite Aid, you know, uh, um, bankruptcy and stuff. But they're inconsistent hours. You know, they'll be, sh- they'll shut down stores two and three days at a time because oh. they don't have staff. Oh. And so, you yeah. know, people that are at, or they're having to wait, you know, three, four, five, seven days for a script, or they're on the phone for three hours waiting mm. on hold. That experience is really driving the, the traffic to us as well. Right. Um, and at this point, we're not selectively choosing patients. We're taking, you know, pretty much everybody. Um, because we also have, have technology with you guys and, and other vendors um, and processes that allow us to do a lot of volume of scripts, um, mm-hmm. you know, with, with, a, with a, a nice tight staff. I mean, I think that's one of our success points is we don't overstaff um, and we use the technology and, you know, robots and, and workflow and med sync and all that kind of stuff to manage that. So, but yeah, we, we're, we're doing a lot of scripts. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just been, I've been listening to some people. Some people are like, man, I just can't take somebody who's doing nothing but C2s and, and things like that. Right. And just like, I'm, those are, those are hard ones, you know, those the, are, those are the, tough unless, unless they know them, right. Unless they know the patient or they know the physician yeah, even sometimes, but it's, it's, it's a, such a tough market because you know, with the, with the settlement, you know, with the big wholesalers yeah. and stuff, you know, we, we, if we take on one patient that's, or two patients that aren't our normal patients, they could trigger a, throw off you know, a, 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 yeah, throw our allocations and stuff yeah. off, which affect our whole book of business. So that, that dance has been tough. You yeah. know, we've had to ask for threshold increases and different things. But yeah, you know, as far as that goes, we, we definitely have to manage that. Okay. Um, 
well, for sure. Um, so uh, I'm going to get into, stay on the PBM thread a little bit. Um, I know we're kind of coming out of the CVS, um, I don't know, DRI recruitment fog. I think it's lifting a little yeah. bit. Um, that doesn't mean there's not other stuff still coming with like true ups with the GER and BER. I think you, you alluded to those, um, as well. Like I wanted to trying to get everybody's take on like post that event. Um, what's the, what's the world? Is it everything looking a little clear? Is it still, you know, um, you know, I sit on the align on the align board. Mm-hmm. So I get, you know, get to see under the covers on a lot of that. And, um, I, we're, we're, we're coming out of the fog. I mean, I kind of said, you know, when we spoke a lot last year on the cliff, you know, in the yep, tail, yep. you know, the DAR cliff on January one, the tail of all the, you know, retroactive uh, recruitments that are going to be happening through the spring and into the summer. And I kind of said July one, I mean, I, you yeah. know, this is just Jeff Harrell being a pharmacy economist, but I said, July one, we should be in pretty good shape. And that, that really actually has, um, you know, ha- has manifested, Okay. you know, we kind of followed that timeline. I will say, though, that there's a lot of confusion out there in the market. You know, people don't understand their contracts. They don't understand what a true DIR is versus a BER, GDR, true up. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, people keep saying, well, I'm still getting my DIR taken out, DIR taken out. Well, you know, you're dealing with Optum, who's got a true up if, you have a, if you're in a burger contract. Um, if, uh, you know, ESI's got a true up going on right now, uh, there's a little Aetna, late, little Aetna DIR that's going to hit and you know, it's, it, it's, it's 24, 23 is DIR, but the data is so delayed mm-hmm. that it's going to bleed into 25 a little bit. Not a lot of dollars there. I don't think it's anything to really be super concerned about, you okay. know, um, unless you got a heavy payer mix. But um, for the most part, I, you know, I think we're through it, um, okay. you know, and, and I think we're, we're still having to deal with these, these burger contracts, which, you know, unfortunately should have never been brought into the industry. Uh, they were. Um, everybody kind of followed it and now we're, you know, we're trying to get out of them because it, it really doesn't give pharmacies the clarity of what they're getting paid, um, you know, in different regions and stuff because of these, these true ups and stuff. So, um, but I, you know, I, I think we're there, you know, as far as being able to now run your business, know what the cash flow looks like and, um, you know, and see where you're at. A little, little, little more predictable. I, I, I just say a little more, a little more, um, yeah. I keep on the the burger contracts piece. I do feel like sometimes when I just talk to folks in general, and I'd like to get your perspective, you talk to a lot of your own group and you talk to a lot of folks that may be looking to uh, sell their stores as well. You talk to a lot of those uh, folks. Um, And I do feel like sometimes it's easy to be at the, I'm just going to say in, far, in, in Pioneer, it's called the fill station, but it's easy to be at like the check station. You're doing pharmacist verification and going, man, I can't keep filling this script. And then you go in the back end and you look at it and the ones who have the time and do the due diligence may go, Oh, actually that's not the right decision. Let me go put some of this in. But uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on, on monitoring what you got to monitor to make sure you're making the right call. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're spot on there. Um, and again, that goes back to data, goes back to technology, but we as pharmacists and pharmacy owners, I mean, it even goes back to what you said with us bringing up and teaching a young pharmacist or a graduate about business. We go to pharmacy school. I, I encourage people to take business classes, uh, you know, uh, in in pharmacy school if you're going to go into to business um, because you need to know that. We don't know how to read a P&L and balance sheet coming out of college. Sure. And so, sure. um, you know, at the end of the day, it's how profitable are you at the end of the day? What's your net profit, you know? Uh, your your costs, you know, minus your revenue. Here you are. How you know how that all bleeds out? But you're you're spot on on um, on that those scripts because there are some contracts out there that are horrible. Um, mm-hmm. You know, ESI ESI is eating people alive. I mean, I'm you mm-hmm. know, I'm not going to pull any punches there. They're yeah. eating them alive. Um, but we're very transactional, um, and pharmacists and pharmacy owners are transactional. So we see that loss and we panic. Or we get a phone call from a third, secondary, or tertiary wholesaler, and they've got a you know a deal on that drug. And okay, if I buy that drug right now, I'm getting it at that price right there. However, you might have just screwed up your whole um, al- algorithm for your buying, and you might miss a tier on on a on a potential rebate or or an incentive with your wholesaler. And so we have to get past the transactional because at the end of the day. It's not that one claim. It's what your business is doing at the end of the day, you know, profit wise. Um, you know, maybe the generics made up for that loss. Uh, we've seen that a lot in our in our group in, in these segments. Um, 
what if that script was a 340B script? Oh, right? that's fair. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, so right now you lost 20 on paper, but you actually made 60 uh, on uh, on the 340B side. So you're hitting net 40. Why would you turn that away? Um, you know, so, and then also, you know, if you start kicking a lot of business away or, or, or saying no to certain PBMs, and granted, there's thresholds for this. Yeah, I'm not yeah. saying uh, yeah. take it all, uh, no, trust yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> but there's thresholds for this yep. that, um, you know, if you, if you move a half million dollars off your purchase side by not taking a certain plan, have you just jeopardized a level of, you know, generics that, you know, a, a generic tier mm-hmm. or a brand incentive or whatever that looks like now for your whole book of business? And so then at the end of the day, yeah, you were losing, let's say, 30000 on doing that one plan. But you lost 70000 over here if you, if you got rid of the whole thing right. because of the buy side. So there's a lot. It's, 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 a, it's more than a three-headed monster. Isn't it? Um, yeah. but, it but we got to get past the transactional. And then when you find those claims, dig in, look at the data. If you can identify that certain claims are just bad ones, then you start plucking them out. Right. It's like just plucking the feather off the peacock. Take one out, mm. take another one out. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, the peacock's still beautiful, but it's just missing a few feathers. Right, right, right. And it'll regrow good ones. <laughs> it'll regrow good yeah. ones. It's it's yeah. it's kind of like the message it sounds like is don't get, uh, I think casinos do this, right? Don't get trapped in the casino, right? It's like, because they got all the, all the windows are closed, right? There's no way to actually look outside and things like that. You're just getting like focused on this thing that's in front of you going, hey, you made... You may, on the flip side of that, you may make, may look like you're making a lot of money on stuff. And then you go back and you look at your contract in the back end, you get out of the casino and you're like, oh, I'm not. I, <laughs> not well, at all. And, and that's a good point too, because oftentimes, you know, a lot of these pharmacies, the, you know, the ones that are coming to me to be, that want to be, want to be bought, you know, they don't have their costs in the right. They, you know, their EDI files aren't, you know, their cost files aren't feeding mm, correctly. Yeah. So again, too, they're looking at bad data. Um, and they're making decisions on potentially bad data it may, or you maybe have an old obsolete NDC. I mean, a lot of that stuff's gone away with technology, but those still, you know, still pop up. So um, get away from the transactional um, anxiety, transactional anxiety, and really work the data and look at it and and uh, and make an educated decision on on yeah your nay on certain claims. I'm sure that's a, a a clinical services lens too that you're layering on as well. Like yeah, sure you may be almost net negative with the patient on the fills, but obviously maybe there's this maybe they're part of X Y Z um, in some way from the clinical services side. I feel like you've really like leaned into all of that as well. So for ten years or more, mm-hmm. we've been banging this clinical services you know uh, bell. And I've listened to talks and I've, you know, at NCPA okay. and you know, wherever it is, wholesalers, Cardinal, whatever, uh, McKesson, you know, um, ABC, or I think they got a new name now. Uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> a- anyways, um, every time I listen to them, there's no ROI. When I say that, uh-huh. real ROI. Yeah. They can like justify having a pharmacist put those effort into it and make that pharmacist hours plus some to put to the bottom line. Um, and that's one of the things that's on my top priority list and, and why we hired you know, Tara as well is we're building out a whole clinical services program. Um, and it goes right into you say, you may lost a little bit on that script, but if that patient qualifies for some clinical services that we can pick 60, 70, 80 bucks up on, um, and then you know, again, you know, that patient's worth keeping or, and I think we, we talked about this in the past too, we have some really, um, unique front ends in some of our stores you know, with mm, either high end yeah. supplements or um, we're using naturopaths and herbalists uh, as our employees on the floor. Uh, so patients come in and see them. So we may lose on the pharmacy side, but we're really winning on on the front end side on these patients, too. So, again, another layer to, to layer in there. Um, but, yeah, so it's it's but, yeah, it's let's talk it's about cut and dry. Let's talk about front end a little bit. You've got some unique one, just you, you have a fairly like unique uh, I'll just say collection of pharmacies is probably a bad way of saying it, but um, you've got some in some urban environments, you've got some in very rural environments, um, but you have really unique front ends at some of these pharmacies. Can you talk through a little bit of some of those things that make, and what you guys are kind of do that, that make some of your front ends like really special? Yeah. So um, we do, we do have unique and we do have geographical diversity, you know, in rural to coastal communities to wherever. Um <clears throat> 
obviously the density of the population helps, you know, so the Seattle ones, you know, have more foot traffic just from, from a pure density standpoint. Um, but we do, we do have unique front ends. We cater kind of to those communities too, like out in rural, um, you know, um, Goldendale, you know, it's, it's a cowboy town, right? So we're, we're tailoring to a little bit of that. The fixtures even have a little, uh, you know, cowboy flair, okay, cool. um, yeah. you know, but you know, back to the, the, the backfill of the pharmaca store that we did in Madison in Madison park, I've spoke on this several times, but, um, it was a, it was a model that, um, I wasn't comfortable with until I got comfortable. Right. So I was uncomfortable being, you know, comfortable being uncomfortable. Anyways, we have herbalists and naturopaths that are our employees on the floor. They, 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 they're the clerks, they're, they're, they're licensed okay. they're Um, and, and, you know, they're not a, a, a high, too highly compensated employee. It's surprising about how much they really wanted. They're not business people. They don't want to run their own business, but they want to see patients that store. Now these patients come in, see them. We sell supplements. We do makeup. We do, I mean, you name it really oh, unique, wow. uh, okay. $42,000 in sales a week right now in that store. Oh, God. <clears throat> front, front end. That's front end only? Not prescription, front end only. Oh my God. Um, and that model is like blows my mind. We know we have other stores that's got things all the way from feather boas to jewelry to, you know, your typical OTC. That's a real big gift store. I mean, that store at Christmas time, you know, 300 K in sales in the month of December plus oh, wow. uh, one, one front end. But again, um, is, is these are unique ones. Like sure, you said, we got sure. another store out, you know, out in, uh, on the sounder uh, area that's uh, 12,000 square feet front end. I mean, we do fishing, we do tackle, we do roasted nuts, we do um, a lot of truffles, um, you know, so we have a lot of uniqueness. Um, don't expect a $42,000 yeah, a week yeah, let's be, in your yeah. community, yeah. but there's no reason you can't be at five, six, ten. Mm-hmm. Um, if you If you just tweak it a little bit and cater to, you know, what you want. Or what the community wants, um, and be unique, right? I mean, how many times have you gone into Costco, bought a shirt, you know, and you go out the next day, and five guys have the same shirt on you bought? You know, people don't want that. They want uniqueness. They they don't want the Amazon feel. Um, and we really, really tailored to that. A lot of a lot of local, you know, local soaps and local oh, okay. um, all right. hand towels, and you know, all that kind of stuff. Farmers market type stuff into our stores. And now you're feeding your community, but you're also giving your customers the opportunity to buy something you just can't get everywhere. Right. Right. Is that also something that you, that you push down to the partners to go, Hey, go figure out your local community and your vendors from that perspective. We, we, we have a program. Okay. We have a front end program now that we're developing out. Um, cause we also f- found out that a lot of the stores are buying from the same vendors. So why can't we <laughs> yeah. pull those purchases? So we we're, we're really, like I said, we're really bringing this Cascadia pharmacy group model um, on the on not just the pharmacy side, but also the front end side. And we have a team of front end managers, and my marketing gal Julie runs that. And um, and yeah, we do. We share those ideas. Again, doesn't not gonna, you know you're not going to sell forty two thousand out on the coast, but if you can get to five or six or seven, I mean that's twenty thousand a month. You know, yeah, <laughs> still yeah. and be unique is what I heard. Be be really unique and think about your local stuff. I I, that makes makes total sense. Such a simple message. And the herbalist and it can be forgotten. The herbalist and naturopath thing, there's something to it. I mean there is because your pharmacists, you know, we've been trying to get the pharmacists to sell more supplements, but they but again we're filling more scripts than we ever have. Or they're not comfortable going out and I don't want to say upsell, but you yeah, know, educating no. the patient, yeah, yeah. you know, because then they get anxiety. They got to get back and check, you know, 200 scripts. Mm-hmm. Now these, you know, wonderful herbalists and naturopaths are on the floor. They're accessible. They're ready. The pharmacist can lean on them. Um, it's, it's. Um, yeah. And from a, and from a labor cost profile, a, a better way to do it e- anyway, it's a tying up a pharmacist to do it anyway. Oh, right. oh like, you know, I went and had lunch with them. The two that were we were trying to bring back in, they'd worked at the store previously. Okay, <laughs> and you know, herbalists and naturopaths are a little bit eccentric. You know, they're unique. Fair. Like I said, don't really want to run their own business, but really into patient, you know, health and patient care, as well as you know, enjoying their lives. Mm-hmm. And so, after about forty minutes of figuring out which item wasn't gluten free, we actually then got got down to talking about numbers. And I think they were making 22 bucks an hour, um, from the previous, you know, regime there. Uh, and they go, I go, well, what do you guys want? I'm thinking, oh man, here we go. They go, we want $25 an hour. I go done. No. I'm out of here. No. You know I mean? <laughs> it was like, and so they don't, these are, they're wonderful people, uh-huh. but they don't need a lot. Um, 
but they really help the community and 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 the sales have been um i mean it, you know the numbers don't lie Cle- numbers cle- yeah there. yeah clearly 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 worth it um okay uh i'm gonna move into i guess we're staying a little bit on the pbm thread if if uh you want to go let's keep going there um legislatively though you're you're really active um uh and all that you're on the board um at a line chairman of AAP and also I was president elect of NCPA. Um, what I'd like to just get your thoughts or what you're thinking about this coming, obviously you're about to be, uh, the president, uh, starting in October, but, um, the rest of this year going into the lame duck. And then after, after that, you know, just kind of going forward, what are you, how, what are you, what's your stump right now you're on? Um, yeah, with- that's, that's a tough one for me because I'm, 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 I'm optimistic in some areas and I get frustrated uh-huh. quickly in others. And, you know, we've, you know, like I'm, we're, we're in Oregon right now battling, you know, yeah. in fact, t- later, later today we're on a PBM call. Um, I sat straight across from the PBMs in, in this uh, work group and uh, PBM um, legislators, the lobbyists. Okay. Um, and they were all there. I mean, you, you name them, they were there. And I don't know. And I, 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 I hope you don't cut this out, but I don't know <laughs> if I, I hope these people aren't as stupid as they act. Okay. I hope I hope that it's a training procedure to cause a disruption to get the representatives and, and senators and 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 um, and those people in let uh, in in um, government confused so that they don't understand sure. what we need and where because. It, it's mind blowing. It was a cross between the Muppets and Saturday Night Live. Oh wow! I mean, it was just like, like mind blowing. Um, I do think, though, you know, bring it back to the bills. I mean, NCPA works so hard. Yeah, I mean, um, great. Rana and Ann mm-hmm. absolutely bust for for our industry, um, and I do feel like we were just, it, you know, just there on the last bill mm-hmm. and. Again, relationships and leverage, you know, got things you know peeled back, um, and so. But there's momentum. I mean, you, you saw the um, hearings so. not too long ago. There's yeah. momentum, um, and and it's sad to say this, but you almost have to hit rock bottom in your industry before people look up, right? I mean, we're losing what 1.1 pharmacies a day, yeah. and that's not just independents; that's chain independents. And we are looking to reduce the whole pharmacy footprint in the United States by 18% by 2025. Mm. That's a lot. That's a lot. Right? That's a lot. And so we're at that point now where if something doesn't happen, you know, we're going to have um we're going to have pharmacy deserts. Um and and we're seeing it right now and CMS's guideline for rural at 15 miles has to change. Doesn't because it though? like isn't that it, an old antiquated it, one it, I didn't even think it was a great it, measure to begin with, but at times, but It's terrible, man, because like the reason it's all done by people are, I call them armchair quarterbacks, yeah. you know, just looking at a Google map or whatever it is. Yeah. And the thing, the thing about it is, you know, we got a store um, out, out, outside of Spokane, right? Well, the next store is less than 15 miles, but in the winter time, they got to go through it's snow and ice. It's a beat down, right. You yeah. know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, what, I, what we're starting to see um, is this, this critical access movement, a cap. Um, and with that critical access, you get those designations, Washington and Oregon, um, both uh, Washington has it and they're enforcing it okay. really helped us really, oh, really has helped us in the manage Medicaid. Oregon has it. Uh, the designations are on the stores, but there's no real teeth behind it. However, I will say the PPMs are listening and the needles moving a little bit there. Um, again, this is outside of legislation. I mean, Oregon hasn't passed a bill in 10 years that have put one red cent in the pocket. Mm-hmm. And guess what? Oregon's the number two state in the country with the least amount of independence. And the number two state in the country with the least access to pharmacies. Mm. They haven't passed one legislative bill in 10 years that have put one red cent into pharmacies. So I'm pushing there. But again, I get so frustrated because a lot of it's out of our control. Sure. I mean, it really is. There's relationships. There's the unions. They throw a risk out there. Mm-hmm. I mean, you name it. Um, and and it's <laughs> if, if you really un- if you really looked at it, it's criminal. Yeah. Yeah, you know, but but it, uh, I only can do what I can control, and that's where you know I've gotten into pockets with certain stores and gotten you know I don't um, I, I control the lives of, of and and I'm able to then move the needle a little bit with contracts by having so many lives in certain areas. That that makes total um, sense. <clears throat> um, yeah, 
where would uh what would you suggest then so like I, i'm gonna I, I know i know you're like i'm doing my best um I, but and some of it is out of the control but where where do you feel like if you're a pharmacist listening to jeff going where would you spend some of your time if you have some extra time to to commit to this where where are you looking i'm sure it could it's i'm sure it's different for everybody's equation a little bit from your your state situation to your local and employer situation all the way up to national but what are, what are you thinking about what everyone really could could kind of do to help push this a little more? It, it, it's it's simple. We as pharmacies and pharmacists owners and pharmacists, we can complain all we want. They don't care about us. When the patient complains and file and and, and puts in a report or, or, or sends in a, uh, uh, a a letter, they listen. Okay. Um, NCPA has got a big campaign right now. I, I, I was just on a call a few days ago. I can't remember the number, but I want to say it's uh, uh, tens of thousands of patients now have, have put in. So get your customer, get your patients to file a complaint or a letter of concern to CMS. To the, They'll listen to them. Okay. Simple. Right. Get the consumer slash patient on your side. Yeah. The more they hear from the customer or the patient, the more they'll listen. And, um, you know, the numbers that are, are starting to come in are, are the highest they've ever been. And and CMS is seeing that. So um, if you if one thing you can do is encourage your, your patients to to reach out to the representatives, but to, to put the letters in. Um, yeah. Yeah. And get the template for them. Like make it easy, I guess. Right. Like um, yeah. that's the way I look at that too. So you're right. Like if you don't feel like you, you know how to just hit your congressman up, not everybody has that direct channel or, or feels confident even doing that or going to the Capitol, wherever they're right. at, you can always talk to your patients. You can always get them on board. But yeah. And, and a lot of that's done by not having, you, know, you can do it electronically, you know? And so that, that like you said, there's that fear, uh, that fear's taken away. Mm -hmm. Um, so okay. for sure. And, and uh, they could go to the NCPA website, you know, and, and there's some links to, to being able to help, you know, help file that, uh, the pharmacist can find the path to help their patient All right. uh, e easily, um, have access to that. That, that makes sense. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to turn it optimistic cause you said it. What are you optimistic about? I'll tell you, um, I have never been more optimistic optimistic and excited about pharmacy than right now. Yeah. Um, I know that we're having some consolidation. Um, some of it might've been a little bit necessary. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 I tell this anecdote 10 years ago, you made money by accident. Five years ago, um, you had to work a little harder, but you still made money. COVID hit, everybody got government cheese, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it, saved, it rescued a lot of, of poor operators. Um, and when the government cheese ran out, here we are today, um, with pharmacists, you know, pharmacy owners that are either, and I don't want to say they're bad operators. It's a lot of bureaucracy and paperwork and recredentialing and all that stuff that's just insane. Um, and it's just hard. So they're just tired. They're worn out, right? So it's the things you got to do to stay relevant and to stay compliant and mm. to stay legal um, that's just frustrated them. And so they're, you know, they've transitioned out. But I'll tell you, um, we're being recognized and we're in the spotlight more than we ever have been. And we are a, pre a premium product. Independent pharmacy is a top shelf, grade A, Japanese A5 Wagyu <laughs> product. I love and it. What, and tell me, let me ask you this. When you go to a restaurant, do you pay more for a Wagyu than you do a regular steak? Absolutely. Okay. Do you pay more for a Pappy Van Winkle than you do a, a you know? Heck yeah, you a do. Can a Canadian club? Uh -huh. Okay, so... We are that premium product. We are that top shelf. And I think you're, we're getting recognized, you know, whether it's through some of this clinic, cr uh, critical access designation stuff that mm -hmm. seems to be um, coming up. Because we do things. We give services that others don't. The, yeah. you know, the, the chains, the mail orders, none of them give what we give, whether it's delivery, med sync, bilingual, stay hours open later, mm -hmm. Um Immunization, shots, consultations, weight loss, blood pressure, diabetes monitoring, smoking cessation, hormone replacement. I mean, I could keep going on and on where we do that. That's premium. And we're going to start seeing we're, we're starting to see it. But I think really um, we, we will we will get paid eventually better for for a premium product. And that's what we are. 
Um, I think what you'll also see in about 18 to 24 months is if we get some legislation done and we do start seeing, you know, a little bit better reimbursement for the services that we give that are premium, I think you'll start seeing some stores open back up. I okay. mean, and I think you'll start seeing some some green fields, some backfills, and I think you'll start seeing that number rise again. I hope. But um, I, I feel it. I'm excited. My team's excited. Um, you know, our numbers are in really good shape coming out of the cliff and, and the tail of the mm-hmm. DIR. Um, and I'm hopeful. What's the new, what's the new, I, I, you talk about a lot of shifts there, a lot of shifts and uh, I don't know, things you have to do, things you're layering on, but like even mindset a little bit, what is the, what does the go forward owner have to, I, I feel like you always have a good handle on this, but what is the, the owner that's coming in here ne- this year? and going to start their business that's going to uh, propel them for the next 20 to 30 years until they figure out their own exit strategy. It's a different game than it was 20 years ago. Um, not to trivialize, maybe the game's the wrong term, but it's a different, it's a different practice, form of practice, I think. What do you think the new, the, the owner today has to be willing to do or the, mind, the right mindset of um, for the next 10 to 20 to whatever it is to sustain their livelihood over the next however long? They got to be diverse. Mm. They got to do immunizations. They got to fig- we, we'll, we'll get the clinical services figured out. That, you know that they got to do clinical services. They got to run their pharmacies as lean as possible. I've, I've, we've talked about the money stuff many times. All the different ways that we leak money like a boat. You know, you, know, you got to make sure your boat doesn't have very many holes. I mean, our industry leaks more money than I've ever seen. It. You know, I, I don't know what other industry you can lose more money on the on on a stroke of a keyboard than ours but you know you got to make sure your boat doesn't have very many holes um you got to be nimble um you got to be able to pivot on a dime that's what's made us so successful in independent pharmacy is we are able to to pivot right i mean we're we're a speedboat with with you know with with 300 you know three 300 uh, horsepower motors on the back we can turn on a dime instead of that big ship carrying you know carrying the cargo has to you know you know turn three miles uh, in advance um, they got to, they got to network. Okay. Mm. They got to mm. get in to the industry and they got to get out their head out of the sand. Um, you do all of that. You got good work ethic. Um, you got to buy, right. You got to sell, right. You got to have technology. You got to have workflow. You got to have uh, med sync. You know, you need to be doing combo med doing, if you're doing mm. a little LTC in your street, you know, that you got to look at some compounding, you got to do it all. Um, it's not just a fill prescriptions anymore and make good money. It, you got to do it all. Right. Right. Now that makes, that makes, that makes total sense. It's a, it's a lot of diversity, um, that, that even we see now when we're like, I, I know when we demo our solutions, this isn't a plug for pioneer. I never do this, but like the, the, I'll say this, the people you're, we're talking to is just way different than it was when I was here doing this. 10 years, just 10 years ago, you know, it just, it just is, you know, MedSync was more getting started and that's where we did kind of cut our teeth a little bit. And now it's not just MedSync, but all of these other things that we see, at least in some of the successful pharmacies we see, um, are, are, are totally adopting the same, same approach that you're talking about. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, from the pioneer standpoint, have you seen, um, the industry and how do I word this correctly? Um, I bet you're seeing more inquiries for API access, for integration, for all these different technologies to try to streamline that workflow, to try to you know streamline that checkout. Yep. Um, I, I, I can only imagine that you guys are getting pinged more than you ever have. That, and so that's that's telling you something right now. That's one. Th- that is a great market signal. I, I guess, or industry signal, I think is the way I synthesize that to a degree. And it's Josh and the product team's job to like sil- filter through and sift through what's real, what's not. Cause there's some people that are just like, they don't even have a story yet with pharmacies, but they just know there's a market there. And then you got some people that have real solutions that are already doing stuff with pharmacies. And so you're a hundred percent right. And, and the more and more, um, obviously from 10 years ago to now, one, we have a, a, a few more customers, but two, um, you're just seeing a, a, a much bigger need or a broader need for all of the other things they're trying to layer in and do it in a way where patients want to be met. I, I'd right. say other thing. Right. Um, right. Right. I mean, that we're, you know, demographics are changing, uh, generations are changing, uh, and we got to match what they're wanting. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, okay, cool. I think I'm, I'm running into time a little bit, but I wanted to get a little bit to some of the fun stuff. Um, 
you last I checked, you owned an oyster farm, and well, I wanted to understand how the oyster farm is going, um, and along with the other businesses that you you like to uh, venture into. So pharmacy has been <laughs> it's uh, been good. Pharmacy, to you, right? yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's allowed me to do some stuff that you know. I mean, it's a grind. Pharmacy's a grind, right? I mean, you, you go home tired, so. Uh, being able to do some non-pharmacy things, you know, gives you a little energy. And, and I've been fortunate. A lot of this come from the community I was born and raised in, mm-hmm. uh, you know, where people are aging out. But yeah, so I, uh, I have an oyster farm up on Hood Canal. Um, uh, and it is, uh, only reason I bought it is I ate the oyster. It's the best oyster I've ever eaten. And I will put it up against anyone who listens to this podcast. There we go. You can, Challenge you, accepted, everyone. You can, you can get a hold of me. You know how to find me. Um, the oyster is amazing. Um, it's in a unique area. The land is unique. Um, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, although I have, I could put a little bit more uh, effort into it, and I think it would do better. And that's our goal for, for uh, 2025. Um, uh, and then we've also gotten in, I got a, a bakery. Yeah. So we bought a yep. 1908 bakery that, you know, I, I lost my daughter. Uh, it's six years old. I think, you know, you guys know yep. that. And so we bought that bakery and and put it in her name, and um, it's iconic. Um, so busy, He's such a uh, yeah. a, 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 a de- destination for people yeah. that visit out here on the coast. And then a little family fun center, little restaurant. I got yeah. a candy store, little bar. Um, I will say the hospitality stuff um, has made my beard go gray. Oh, and really? Some of it's pharmacy, but the hospitality is another another industry. So if, if any of you out there are looking to dabble in something different, get a hold of me so I can give you the, <laughs> give you, you why know, not to do it, what not to do, and <laughs> yeah, what not to do. But uh, you know, it's been fun. Um, you know, it's given given people opportunity to do things. Um, you've kept businesses alive and communities yeah. that that need them. Um, so it's been fun, but yeah, no, the oyster farm is is cool. Lillawap Oyster Company, uh, Lillawap. Lillawap, Washington. Do y'all ship? Uh, we are uh, hopefully by October first. Right. We will be doing direct to consumer. Okay, yeah. cool. All right, y'all hear it. We'll drop the we'll drop the link in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah there we go. <laughs> and you can challenge Jeff to an oyster off if you want later. Yeah, uh, he'll be at NCPA. <laughs> a funny story. I'm down in New Orleans, and God, I'm going to get people upset with me with this, but I got a- I got to go there anyways. And so I'm <laughs> in New Orleans, and New Orleans is known for their oysters. You yeah. know, Acme, all these places, yeah, and they're lined Drago's, up. Drago's Acme. Yep, yep. Uh, so I go there, and and I I order some, and I'm going. Oh boy, I don't know how these people have eaten these things. You know, they're both oysters. And I, I had a drink or two. I'm not, you know. Yeah. And I said to the guy, I said, you know, I, I got a farm out west, and I'm, I'm not here trying to, uh, to you know, be um, obnoxious or anything. But I go, these aren't. I mean, these aren't good. I mean, what, what do you put on these things? Ten W thirty, and uh, <laughs> that didn't go over well. And then the yeah. next thing I said was, hey, I, I think I'm going to have a T-shirt that said that let friends don't let friends eat gold oysters. And <laughs> and they were like, by that time, they were like, okay, Mister Hurl, I think it's time for you to leave. <laughs> so, um, it was just a funny story. Um, I, I just and, gets, and I can just see you being different. dragged out of the restaurant yelling, my oysters are better. <laughs> so, just uh, it just just kind of a funny thing because you know what. We only know what we know, mm-hmm. and they love that oyster out there. And so yeah, not, I shouldn't put it down because that's what they know. But our West Coast oyster is something special. All right. All right. Um, okay. Um, after that, I always I don't let anybody leave without something that uh, to talk about what they're doing, reading, watching, listening, or they're doing or they're into that you think other people who watch and listen to this would be interested in. Um, I'm on pins and needles. Yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's not basketball anymore because I've had too many surgeries. Okay, so okay. Uh, I'll tell you, and I'm not a golfer because I don't like doing things I'm not good at. <laughs> um, but I will tell you right now where I'm at is is in the bourbon world. Oh, really? Um, yeah, uh, trading, uh, collecting, and drinking, and uh, uh, it's another whole world. Um, uh, almost underground. Um, yeah, you know, the, the the stuff you see in the grocery stores, you're you're uh, you're. You're just getting the the high volume um, stuff that that's not all the allocated, all the limited distribution, all the one off stuff. You never see it. And I've gotten into these groups actually through one of my partners, Andy. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, he came on as a partner. My my marketing gal visits every store when she goes out there. Julie sent me a picture of all these bourbons. I go, where have you gotten these? I've never seen these. And uh, he shared to me with what he's doing. And it's some face. I don't do much social media, but. Uh, this, this Facebook groups and stuff, and uh, I've gotten some beautiful stuff. And um, 
We were down at Buffalo Trace about two or three weeks ago. Andy won a barrel pick of uh, Weller 107 Antique. And believe it or not, we got Freddie Johnson, who is uh, the uh, Neat. If you've seen Neat on Netflix, I've seen we neat. got yep. Freddie. Yep. I mean, like surreal. We're sitting there with Freddie. And uh, and we go through. We've had four barrels. We picked the barrel. And you know, Freddie talked about, you know, why do you keep that $4,000 bottle of Pappy on the shelf? You know, if you're not going to share it with friends um, and what it's done, this bourbon industry or bourbon, you know, passion for me is it's number one, it's helped me um, with my daughter, honestly, mm, because yeah. I've actually started, I picked, I picked a barrel of uh, whistle pig and I have two other barrels picked and I'm doing a release for her foundation and oh, it's the cool. unicorn blend. And uh, I'd give more information to you, but it's I got the first one released. And I've got the next two lined up, and I'm going to do one every year. So I've been able to go to these distilleries and okay. work with them yeah. and have a unique end. And then the money goes back to my daughter's foundation, which we support the brain cancer sure. uh, kids and different yep. things. And so that's where it's come in as a passion for me is doing these releases each year uh, in her name, uh, making the bottle unique, and picking a very good bourbon for people mm-hmm. to enjoy. Um but, you know, it, it, like Freddie was saying, he's like, you know, uh, when you're with friends and family that you really care about, grabbing that pappy and opening it up is no problem at all. Yeah. yeah. You know, you're, you share that because we don't know how long we're here for. Mm-hmm. I mean, tomorrow is, could be our last and, and a week from now could be our last. And someone else will take that pappy down and drink that pappy um, and you're gone. And so, it, you know, share it with friends and, and be with friends. And I'm sure it's a quote many people have heard, but but. You know, um, he raised his glass. Um, Freddie raised his glass to us, and he says, "There are, you know, there are good ships and there are old ships, and there are ships that sail the sea. But friendships are the best ships. May they all be. You know, and we're all in tears, yeah. and we're all raising yeah. our ass and Holy hugging and patting, Holy and it just it's just created something in my life that I needed. Um, and so now I, I have become a snob. Are, are you? I, yeah, I was going to say, are you kind of pretentious snob. about this now uh, a little bit? That, that's an understatement, man. <laughs> that's an understatement, Mark. But uh, anyways, I uh, I travel with my bourbon. Okay. So it, it, everywhere I go, it comes with me and, and I pour uh, my pours. They have some, you know, they have a lot of travel, unique travel packages and stuff. But it's been a lot of fun. You know, my NCPA family, my AAP family, my Alliance family. Nice. Um, We've really shared some special moments with some really nice pours. Nice, man. I had my first, that, that's cool. I had my very first sip of Pappy. Um, I think it's a 20 year. I, I don't know him. I'm not a near as well versed as you. Just like two weeks ago. Just like it's the very yeah. first time I ever had it. It was great. Great. I, pa- I'm not pa- as yeah, good. It's, it's great. But Pappy has, um, has a, a, you know, has this aura. It know? does. It there, does. There's a lot of good pours out there equal to or better, yeah. actually probably better than that are at a, at a better price point. But yep. Pappy has the Pappy it, name. It and, does. It's and got the, the name. And, yeah. um, and I should say too, you know, I said my, my NCPA and AAP and Align family, but my CPG family, my, my partners, mm-hmm. um, you know, they're, they're wonderful. And, you know, we also do, you know, share in, in the oh, bourbon a cool. little bit. So. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Um, I, so favorite bourbon then before we like, what, like I, you probably have a lot of them. You probably can't pick a favorite, yeah. but like, what's your, like, I want a good one go to. It's not, it's not a thousand bucks, but it's a great solid bourbon at a price point that's just uh, mostly accessible. Um, Russell reserve, which is a, uh-huh. which is a, um, a, a, a wild Turkey okay. uh, product. Uh, released their 15 year just recently. Um, and it's magical. Okay. Um, it's very good. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot of other good pours. I love Michter's 10 bourbon. I love I, the, the 20, I love Michter's. It's probably my favorite. Mich- Mich- yeah. yeah. Michter's does a good line. Um, I'm, I'm a you know, actually, fan. Mich- Maker's Mark came out with a seller aged, which is one of their newest kind of limited distribution ones. Um, fantastic. Um, I'm a little lower proof guy. I'm kind of a weenie. Um, so, so I sit, you know, sit on the lower proof right now, but it's funny as I've gotten into this and I'm probably a year and a half, two years into it. I have, my proof has gone up yeah. and I've actually, you know, I don't, I don't drink it with ice or water. Uh, I drink it with just neat and the flavors and you're not pouring a lot. You're not, you're, the, the, where I've pivoted is I drink to enjoy. I don't drink to get drunk. It's not a volume. <laughs> or for, or it's not a volume play. Buzz. Yeah. My <laughs> dad's like, well, I just drink this to get a buzz. I don't care about the flavor. I'm like, dad, then you're not getting any of this. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you this. Yeah. <laughs> I'll and give you the so gym just, just really enjoyed right. the flavors and the uniqueness and, and the time and effort people put into aging and stuff. Uh, uh-huh. So just, yeah. But yeah, I, I right now that, that Russell Reserve 15 is, 
I just drinking like it's magical like candy. All right, yeah, magical. All right, all right. Um, I I don't think I really brought one. I had one the last week, and I'm gonna. Um, but I will piggyback off of like what happened or what closed out last week, which was the Olympics. I was such a, like, I never watch it. I never watch it. I watched way more Olympics than any one healthy person should this year. Um, I couldn't figure out fencing for the life of me of who wins until the judge tells you who wins. I still can't, I don't know who's winning when they're winning, but, um, but it was fun. It was good. And, uh, I do think it was a, just a good tour for the U S in general, but a lot, of, a lot of cool people seeing like first time countries winning things like that, what they're doing for their country. It was such a cool thing. And then Snoop Dogg, like Snoop, like, I mean, Snoop, I mean, <laughs> I was everywhere. You know, it's funny you say about the fencing. Um, I mean, that's a point type of a situation, but the break dancers get me <laughs> <laughs> the new break dancers. I'm watching but, these and it's cool. Yeah. But how do you, how do you judge I, the, that style, you know? And, and now we got a little controversy with the, you know, the, the, the bronze medal, you yeah. know, the gymnastics and that. stuff. And, you know, now it's all coming out, you know, that, that, uh, that, that board really works with Romania. I mean, just yeah. the, the, the politics and stuff, but let's, let's get back to, to Steph Curry, Snoop, uh, the basketball team. That, I mean, with Steph, I mean, Steph was ridiculous. That was, I mean, that was one of the ridiculous. coolest things I've ever watched. Uh, it, basketball it's wise. Not, it's not human. He's almost unhuman. It's like, he's got laser eyes and depth and all of that. But you know what that, you know what that goes back to Mark? That goes back to, we see him in the limelight. Uh, he is in that gym dude, more than we are in our pharmacy. You think he has a basketball yeah. in his hand? You know what I mean? You, like it's the it, you it, you're only good if you put in the effort, man. And you're and uh, you, you got to have talent. You got to have uh, you know um, genetics and stuff. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But, you know, b- back to Snoop. I mean, uh, you know, from the chronic to holding <laughs> the light and the torch. Um, you know, the guy's done it right. And yeah. I'll tell you why. Where where for me, where I think it's come in is he really got into the sports programs with his kids and stuff and did some great stuff for his communities and different things, you know, and uh, partnered with Martha Stewart and different stuff. And and his image, although back in the day, you know, was a little bit, you know, on the, that side of, you know, things, chronic, the rap, whatever, uh, he's, he's quite the ambassador. I mean, if you really sit back and peel it back, he's quite the ambassador and done a lot of good things for his community, uh, you know, for the sports program. I mean, he was in a fencing outfit to a jockey, you know, horse racing outfit to, you know, whatever. Um, and people loved it. I mean, the guy's charismatic. He can talk. Yeah. Um, he had as many wardrobe just, changes he, as like a Taylor Swift concert, I felt like, you know? <laughs> he is smooth as silk, man. <laughs> yeah. Smooth as silk. And so, um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I enjoyed it as well. You know, I didn't get to watch as much because of the time difference sometimes. But, yeah. No, really enjoyed it. It was fun to watch. All right. Well, uh, we're going to let you get, I think we're going to let you get back to your call. I think you're prepping for. Um, yeah, from that great. Perspective. <laughs> okay. it, so, it's, it's some, Muppets meet Saturday Night Live. Here we go. Maybe I should yeah, so. <laughs> bring Snoop. Will maybe Fer- take Snoop Will, with Will you. Will Ferrell action and, yeah. and the chef on the Muppets. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, Matt, I, I appreciate it, guys. Uh, I always love it. I um, love to help our industry. Um, you know, people can get a hold of me. Love to help. And, uh, it's my passion. Yep. Yeah. Just Appreciate go to the, your website. Probably best way to get to you, right? Which is uh, what's the Cascadia? Uh, yeah, C- CascadiaPharmacyGroup.com. dot com. There you go. Uh, yeah. Right now, and uh, yeah, you can reach me through that. Um, so no, there we go. Appreciate All right. it. We'll put your foundation in the show notes as well. If anybody wants to do yeah, that, yeah, I'll, I'll send you that information so. uh, if they want to buy a bottle too for. For donation, um, the link will be in there. Good stuff. All right, man. We'll uh, appreciate awesome. you being on. Yeah, I appreciate you guys. All right. Take care. All right, Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.